All right. All right, cool. So welcome to our workshop. Um, this is part three of our prototyping design series. Um, it's going to be on CAD or uh, basically engineering 3D modeling. So first off, uh, we'll have Summit just sort of introduce the Startup Center. Yeah, um, you go to the next slide. Jovan. Which slide? Wait, did you present it? Because we still see the uh, actual, like. Oh, is it um, not on the right screen? Yeah, it's not presented. Oh, I see, okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So welcome to the Student Startup Center. This is our virtual series for this quarter. Um, uh, next slide. Is it, okay, do you see, do you see like, like full screen right now? No. No? Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, let me try to fix that real quick. There we go. Awesome. Cool. So just start over. Welcome to Student Startup Center. This is our virtual quarter online where we're going to teach you guys attempt to at least. So the Startup Center is kind of like an on-campus makerspace with a lot of entrepreneurial aspects. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, and we really want to help all UC Davis students start their ventures, whether that be like you're at some point in your company or you want to start you have you just you're starting out with an idea and you want to take it somewhere and build a prototype or if you just have some questions about the more business side of things where we have people here to help you with any aspect of your journey um, next slide so we do this by providing a few different resources the first off is classes like uh actual class you sign up with and schedule builder uh the first is engineering eight which is like the intro to entrepreneurship the actual theoretical side you learn the vocabulary and stuff like that um, then from there, you can go into Engineering 80, which is called Launching a Business, and that's yeah, exactly what you do. You come in, you form a team, you like build your prototype, you do your like market research, and then you make your pitch deck. And from there, we also have Hacking for Defense, which is Engineering 198. It's similar to Engineering 80, except all of the prompts are given to us by the Defense Department, and you don't have your own actual idea for your um, prototype. And if you take those classes in conjunction with a couple of other um, like kind of general education classes and you have some startup like experience or some sort of hands-on experience you can file to get our certificate of entrepreneurship it basically says that you've completed the classes that we've outlined you have knowledge of entrepreneurship you've taken the initiative to actually go in and work on something with hands-on experience and all so there's some more information about that on our website you can see the whole list of classes we also provide our makerspace and our prototyping technologies for all students, which includes free access to our 3D printers, our laser cutter, our CNC router, and our Arduino, and our various electronics equipment, along with our VR lab. So if you ever need access to any of that, you can send us an email, or when we're in person, you can come by the Startup Center during our open hours and ask about any sort of resource you may need. We also teach a variety of workshops, ranging from like soft skills, such as group leadership, to more technical hands-on workshops, which is 3D modeling where we, where we are at today. Uh, various prototyping technologies like 3D printing and laser cutting, which we had in the previous weeks, and our VR lab workshops, which include like hands-on development experience with Unity. Um, and from there, we also have some other ev more events that are geared towards entrepreneurship. So Pitches and Popcorn is every Monday at five o'clock, where we sit down, we watch two to three startup pitches, um, and then you discuss them as like a, how an investor would discuss, view it and try and figure out if it's a good 
if based off the pitch, it's a good company for you to invest your money in. We also have our, uh, our business development workshops on Wednesdays and our mentor visits on Fridays where we bring in a, like an industry member from who's either venture cap, venture capitalist, someone who started their own company, uh, and they can, they'll come in, they'll have like a quick discussion about what they've done. And then they can, they're open to questions for students. And then from there, we have our plasma program, which is a 12 week cohort for 10 teams. You apply in the fall and it happens throughout the course of winter and spring quarter. And where you, this is more for people who have their idea a little bit more established. So like after engineering 80, for example, is when you'd apply for this and you can, you have a weekly meeting with our uh, with the mentor and then from there at the end you'd have demo day which is actually coming up tomorrow so if you want to sign up you can find more information about that on our website and our facebook page so these teams are going to pitch their companies their ideas and from there the judges will award prize money to the top team and then i think you get to vote for the like um the audience's favorite company i think so yeah uh next slide All right, so All right. Yeah, Jovan will go on from here. All right, so since this is part of the, uh, the prototyping uh, workshop series, we want to go over first what is prototyping. So prototyping is the process to get from an idea to a working product. And it's one part of the design thinking process, which um, is a process that, like, that you go through in a bunch of different fields. Like it, it does not just engineering, any, any sort of, any sort of project that you make has to go through this process in, in some way. Uh, so we start off with uh, the first one, which is empathize. And that is basically sort of knowing your audience, knowing your clients, knowing who is going to use the thing that you're going to make. Um, and then, Next up is defining. So now that you sort of understand who you're working with, uh, you have to try to think of what sort of problem or what, um, what you want your, your solution to do for them. Um, so, so in the startup case, this is usually like, you have to find like a, a market like uh, that's, that like needs your needs your product or needs your needs your company, and this is sort of like a, a like a broad definition of your problem. So it's not coming up with uh, solutions just yet. That comes in the next step, which is ideate, and that's when you start just like thinking through, coming up with a bunch of different ideas of like how you want to solve the problem that you want to solve. Um, so these could be like you know like napkin sketches or just like just talking with people, uh, coming up with, with new ideas. And then the next step is sort of what we're focusing on with these, this series, which is prototype. And that's when you, um, that's when you get your, those napkin sketches, get those ideas, and you work on actually uh, building a, sort of a proof of concept of that your idea would work. So, it's like, so the, the key point of prototyping is to try to come up with it quickly. Um, like, so, let's see, um, you don't want to spend, let's say, like weeks on a design, uh, like trying to work out all the little detail, trying to make it look like absolutely perfect, only to notice a huge design flaw in that you could have found if you like just tested it in in like your early stage of development um, the point is to come out with quick prototypes so that you can quickly test and quickly sort of find the problems with and then you can fix those fix those like bigger problems uh immediately rather than having to having to go back and basically restart from scratch later on when you find it. And, and of course the next step is sort of testing your prototype. 
And after that is sort of the most important step is repeating, which I've sort of, sort of mentioned it before, is making, you have to go back after you, after you test your prototype and you notice what can be improved and what, uh, what problems it could have, go back and trying to solve those problems and trying to, trying to refine it and trying to make it better. Um, and you, you might have to go back to different steps of the design process. So you might have to go back to ideate to like come up with solutions to solve your problem. You might, have, you might have to redefine your problem because it might not have been a good problem to solve. You might even have to go back to basically go back to relating with your, uh, with your client because your problem might not, might not be related to, uh, to your client at all. So that's the prototyping process. Um, now CAD is a acronym that stands for computer aided design. And basically that just means using computers to help with the design process. So that could be, broadly speaking, that could be anything. Like if you use Microsoft Paint to draw a logo, like that could, that could be CAD. But usually um, when you hear CAD in, in like the industry, uh, it usually refers to either 3D solid modeling programs, such as SolidWorks or Onshape that they use in engineering, or drafting programs like AutoCAD. So yeah, so we'll get it started. Um, so before we do, actually, we have to sort of get through some, some concepts of uh, what 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 you need to to kind of think about when you when you go into 3d modeling so one thing is projection drawings it's useful to draw these basically these like three views um so it doesn't have to be be these three um just whichever whichever one sort of shows all the details of your uh of your part so typically the uh the three views are the top the front, um, in this case, it's like, I made it a little uh, cross section to show a little bit more detail and the side view, usually the right side. Um, and in this case, which is like in this Lego block, uh, we have, we didn't show the right side view because it wouldn't really show that much detail. Um, every, every feature uh, that you would see in the right side can be sort of inferred from, uh, from the rest of the drawing. But I did uh, include the bottom view because it includes some features that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. So that's something that might be useful to just draw out quickly beforehand or even just like conceptualize in your head. Because like working in 3D, you have to kind of know how to, how to manipulate 3D objects just in your mind and kind of be able to visualize that. Uh, another important part is uh, iterative modeling. So, so if we go back here, you see this hugely complicated uh, like assembly, this huge complicated design. But all that comes down to is it's it's iterative. It you build it up from little little steps, little features um, that over time just add up to become your final model. So. When you look at a three, when you have a, a design, or if you if there's a, a model that you want to try to recreate, you want to try to think about how you can break it down into its simplest form, um, breaking it down into its most basic shape, and then from that shape, what sort of features would you like to add to to get to that final design? So in this case, like in this Lego block, you start out with just the block, um, just a little rectangle that you sort of pull up. It will go over like the different ways to create 3D, uh, 3D object in, in a later slide. Um, and then you add sort of these stud things, um, which will help fit into the other Lego blocks. Um, and then you go to the bottom and you sort of cut a little hole for, for, these, for these studs to fit into. And then uh, the other feature is these tubes that, um, that sort of help provide extra friction. And Um, sorry about that. I'm gonna resend the slide link for the uh, for the people who just came in. 
Um, yeah, so these tubes basically just help provide extra friction uh, for, for these studs to basically lock in a lot better. So you can see that just from these four steps, you can get a fairly detailed uh, Lego block. And another important thing is design intent. So in your CAD software, it, it's very powerful. It can do a lot of things, but what it can't do is it doesn't know what you're doing. Like it, it only know, understands, um, all it stores is basically a bunch of numbers, right? A bunch of little shapes, a bunch of dimensions. It's up to you to sort of structure your design in a way that actually makes it make sense to other people who will see it or even like, so it would make sense to you uh, when you come back to it like a year from now. So, so yeah, so basically someone should be able to, to see your design and understand sort of the relationship between all the different features sort of either like geometrically or like where they're supposed to be placed, some, something like that. Like a good question to sort of ask yourself when you're thinking about design intent is, if you wanted to make changes to your model, like a year from now, when you've forgotten all about it and you like open it up for the first time, um, would you know how you designed it just from looking at it? So we have these two examples here that we'll go into. So you can see this little sketch that has a bunch of little dimensions. Just from looking at it, you can tell that it's, it looks like the bottom of a Lego block or it looks like sort of all the imp important features of a Lego block. Um, with a couple, with some missing, but if you try to make sense of all of these, all of these dimensions, it makes no sense. Um, there's just it just it's a bunch of numbers um, that's not even like consistent. Like we have, uh, we're measuring from the center to the center here. We but then we're measuring from one side to one center. We're measuring diagonally. Um, there's one that's like literally just zero. And it, if you wanted to make changes to this, it would be impossible because um, sort of everything is defined independently and changing one of these dimensions, um, if you wanted to, let's say, change the size of these, these studs, um, you'd have to change each and every one of these and then like have to correct for all of the other mess that, uh, that this, this design has. Um, but if we look at this one, we notice that there's only actually four, uh, four actual like number dimensions. So we have these two, which sort of define the, just the, the length and width of your block. You have uh, sort of the size of the studs, you have the size of the walls, and, and then you have these sort of numbers that, uh, that just sort of show that's, it's, it's an array. So, um, so in CAD, you can sort of make it, make a pattern so that it, it just sort of repeats itself um, regularly. And that sort of shows that well, as well. And everything else is sort of defined using uh, geometric constraints. We'll also go over later. And such as stuff like being tangent. So uh, these circles are all tangent to each other. Um, we have these like horizontal constraints, so we know that they're they're all aligned horizontally, um, stuff like that, and that makes it a lot easier to sort of tell what the relationships are. So we we know that all eight of these circles are supposed to be the same size, and we know that uh, this circle is supposed to be tangent to uh, to this because we know it's supposed to fit into it. Um, yeah, so you can infer a lot just from just from looking at like just studying this uh, this sketch a lot easier than than if you wanted to study this one. So yeah, um, so today what we'll be making or what we'll be showing you how to make is uh, personal maker coins. So maker coins are basically just a a nice like three D modeling and even like a 3D printing exercise where to just sort of play with a, play with 3D modeling, uh, start sort of understand how it works, you know, be creative with it um, and come up with something that can, 
kind of represent you and like and be like a like a cool little uh like a friendly business card kind of thing so if you um you guys have some paper next to you um i'd like you to just take one minute um to just sketch a little logo for yourself so so this is going to be the logo that you're going to be putting on your maker coin um so if you if you're following along uh take out a piece of paper um a key point of that is you know keep it simple um this is a very quick sketch so going back to uh the prototyping like the the design process is we want to want come up with ideas quickly uh, we don't want to spend too long working on a, on a simple idea so we'll um we'll just stay here for like a minute um try to come up with a design and yeah, and then we'll we'll move on. All right, if you guys are following along with the sketches, um, I want you guys to all stop right now um, because again, we don't want to spend too much time on, on just, a, just a quick sketch because we can always refine it later. So now we can start getting into Onshik. Um, so in the rest of these slides, there's a bunch of little tips um, just basically Going through all the different uh, different parts of Onshape and how how it works, um, as well as um, just sort of all the all the, all the basic tools of Onshape. So feel free to go through and uh, and look at that for for more information. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to The actual uh, software. Um, so the cool thing about Onshape is that uh, it can be run completely on your browser. So there's no need to download anything, uh, which is why we like to use it for workshops because it's it's very accessible. Um, it can run on pretty much any computer. Um, and and yeah. Let's get it to load. There we go. All right. So when you start up a new um, a new file, you notice that it has these sort of uh, reference geometry here that you can use. So here's the front, top, and right side views that I was talking about. So what you can do, this is a lot easier to do with a mouse. It is possible with a uh, with a touchpad, but it's very awkward, and I would not recommend it. Um, but you can to basically to rotate you left or you right click and you can sort of rotate around your around your model like this and if you like if you do tiny circles you can like you can sort of adjust the adjust the position of it um holding down you know scrolling in and out will We'll zoom in and out and if you have a mouse clicking the middle uh the middle mouse button 
will pan it. So basically, it'll, it'll move it side to side without changing the rotation of your part. And if you ever get lost, like if you like ever get to like a weird, weird view and you don't, don't know where you are, you can always go to the view cube here. And that will actually go back to sort of these standard views. So you can go align to the top plane, have like a little corner view, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so if we go back to these slides, I wanna go over sort of the, the basics of, um, of parametric modeling. So parametric modeling basically means, um, means 3D modeling where you can kind of go back and change all your different parameters, all your different uh, dimensions and um, and relationships and features and stuff like that. This is like different from direct modeling, which is more like like straight sculpting. Sort of once you make something, if you want to go back and change it, you're going to have to sort of undo a bunch of times, and it's it's a lot harder. But um, but it has it has its uses in uh, other areas as well, though. Uh, so we start off every, uh, before we go into 3D, we have to sort of make a 2D base to sort of, to, to create the 3D object from. And in those cases, we call them sketches. So, so a sketch is, done is created here. So you can create a new sketch. And when you create a new sketch, you have to select a sketch plane. So, so you can choose, depending on what your model looks like, um, you can choose each, whichever one of these, uh, these like origin planes you want. So in my case, I'm going to use the top. And what you can do is you can sort of view normal to the sketch plane to sort of view on the top of it. You notice it's in the wrong orientation. So what I can do is I'll actually rotate it so it's a little bit better and then do it again. And now that you're here, we don't have to, we don't need these reference geometry anymore. So I can actually press the keyboard shortcut P and that will sort of hide everything. And then you can start drawing. So you see there's a lot of these so relatively self self explanatory tools, uh, line rectangles, um, different circles or ellipses, arcs, stuff like that. So what I'm actually going to, to do is I'm going to show a a screen recording that uh, I did previously, which sort of goes through the steps of of making a maker coin um, and. I recorded a few different uh, a few different ways to to actually make this maker coin. So we'll start off with the first one. Um, let's see, to Can everyone see this? Awesome. Thank you. All right. So this is in this one. We'll just sort of go over the basic, um, the iterative design that I sh that I should do before. So sort of going from from a, a, a basic a basic 3D shape and then just adding features to it um, to make our maker coin. See, I view normal to sketch plane, press P to hide everything. And we want our maker coin to be a circle. So we start out with a circle. And 
dimensions are an important part. So I decided to do two inches for, for this maker coin. And that's it for the sketch. Go into a 3D view and then extrude. So an extrude basically just pulls out the 3D shape in a single direction uh, and makes it 3D. So now, now that I have my, my basic coin shape, I can sort of start adding some more features to it. So in this case, I want to make sort of like these like gear type cuts. Um, and I'm doing that by just drawing a sort of like a, a offset circle. I'm sort of dimensioning it. These are the dimensions that I found that to me looks looks pretty nice. So uh, feel free to feel free to play around with it. Um, it's your maker coin after all. So that's a simple simple circle sketch. Now going to a different type of extrude. This time, rather than creating a new 3D object, we're going to remove from an existing one. So I chose that circle. And so to go back there, um, to kind of, to, uh, to elaborate on, on this, there's a bunch of different types of, um, bunch of different modes that you can you can use uh, for each of these each of these tools so for these extrudes you can do blind which is um, so sort of you specifying how how much uh, how much you want to extrude out um, so if you if you have a specific uh, distance that you want it to extrude down in this case though since I just want to cut all the way through for for like a better design intent uh, I decided to sort of make sure that my design sort of uh, communicates that. So I chose a through all here. You see that that's a lot clearer. So there's one cut and I want to repeat that cut all the way around. And I'm doing that with a circular pattern. So right there, we can see that um, there's different types of uh, patterns as well. So you can pattern a part, which is basically doing a copy and paste of a part of each of these parts. So, uh, so I didn't explain this before. So parts are uh, basically every solid object that you make. Um, so every separate solid object will have will be become a different part. Um, and features are stuff like the extrude and um, and the cuts and stuff like that. So every feature, I guess I. Um, every sort of detail that you put on it can be considered a feature. So I want to repeat this feature, this uh, cut feature. Um, so I did that. So I want to repeat that, uh, that cut. And I can select this face because it's a sort of like a circular arc. It, know, it understands that uh, to repeat around that, that arc. And I chose sort of eight, uh, eight cuts to go around. So right here, what I want to do is I want to sort of make a chamfer, basically cut down on the, each of these corners. But I know you notice that this is kind of tedious. I'm kind of, I have to click each and every one of these, these, um, these corners or these edges. And if I, let's say, change the number of cuts I did, um, it wouldn't really, I'd have to go back and like redo that, uh, redo that chamfer again. Um, so what I'm actually going to do instead, so you'll see this bar here, this bar is sort of called the rollback bar. Um, and that kind of, that can kind of roll back your, uh, your, your design to before you added certain features. So you'll see here. I rolled back to before I even made those cuts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a cut to this main edge here. You see that just cut all the way around. And now if I redo each and every one of these, these features, it uh, actually, it does exactly what I want and it's a lot clearer. It has a lot better design inside. And that's basics of how to make a, a very basic maker coin. And 
what we can do next, this is the wrong one. I'm gonna go over a different way to do it. So I want to actually um, put a little bit more detail on the top of, uh, in, into the shape of my maker coin. Um, and this is convenient because this maker coin is a round object. So I'm going to sort of use the revolve tool and I'm going to kind of go into a little more detail about like the sketches. Um, and like the different different ways to like play around with sketches. So I'm going to create a sketch and this time I'm going to use the front view. So now I'm going to start start drawing. So what I'm drawing is I'm going to draw basically if I cut the uh, if I cut my my maker coin in half I want this is basically what I want my cut to look like and I want and I'm going to draw half of that because I'm going to basically rotate it around the center axis here you see now I'm defining some constraints so I want I want this uh, arc to to end flat here so I created a construction line and a construction line is so each of every one of these geometry can be made into a construction by this tool here and what that does is it creates um, it creates geometry there but it won't sort of it won't use it to consider um, when you're trying to create a feature so um, so if you wanted to revolve, you didn't have you wouldn't have to select two um, two different areas. You can just select this one this one shape, and the software will know that you want this whole shape and not have to consider that that line. So now I'm sort of adjusting it. You notice I haven't put any dimensions yet. Right now I'm actually trying to just define just the basic shape of what I want before thinking of uh, how big I want everything. So you see uh, right there. So Onshape will actually uh, sort of try to infer constraints for you. Um, so right there, because sort of I'm trying to work in such a small area, it, it's sort of noticing a bunch of different, uh, different relationships that you might want. And this could be very useful, but in this case, um, it's it was a little bit in the way. Um, so it's trying right now. It's trying to um, infer that I want this line to be parallel to this line. Um, right there, it wants it to be perpendicular to that line. Um, yeah. So I managed to get it where it didn't get any of the constraints because I wanted to show that. You could uh, you can get those constraints manually. Right now, I want these two to be equal. I'm cutting that out just so uh, just so that I won't have to sort of select different uh, different areas when I make my feature. And now I can start defining it. So this is a cool trick. So if you want to do revolves, um, what you can do is, if you have a, if you have a construction line where you where uh, where you want your sort of axis rotation to be, and you measure from that to where you want to measure, um, and you drag it out to the other side, it will. Um, Onshape will understand that uh, you want to do a. A revolve. So. Rather than having to um, having to like do like some some simple math to like what's half of what I what I want uh, the width of this to be, I can just type in the width. So I want this to be two inches, same as uh, the other one.
So another thing uh, to note is that there's these different types of lines. There's these black lines and then there's these blue lines. So black lines means they're means they're um, prop, uh, they're fully constrained, and that means you you notice that I was able to just drag the the points uh, wherever I wanted. Um, that means it has sort of some freedom of movement. It has some ambiguity in like how it's defined. And your goal when you uh, when you make your your sketches is to have everything be have everything be fully constrained. So you see here, uh, I'm defining the length of this, uh, the length of the line here, and then the depth of depth of the little uh, notch there. And now it's fully defined. And that's it. That's my revolve profile. Now I can do a revolve. And it's the same process as the extrude, only it's a, it's just a different, different, uh, a different feature. Here you see, I have this a uh, little bit more detailed design for my uh, for my maker coin. And now I can do the exact same thing. I'm going to define a chamfer, and this time I want to do it on both sides. Uh, and then I can go ahead and create my. Uh, create my gear like cuts, which you'll see here. Exactly the same as uh, the, the one before. Like so. so. Yeah, so there's two different ways of creating the base of your maker coin. And then next, we'll show how you can, oh, yes. So to, I wanted to demonstrate that uh, you can actually go back and edit your sketches. Um, and so I didn't like sort of how deep this, this arc was going. So I wanted to make it a little higher. So I made it go all the way up instead. So this is one of the strengths of uh, parametric modeling is being able to sort of go back and change, uh, change a bunch of your features, um, however you want it, without without having to basically undo a bunch of bunch of stuff you've already done. All right. So now we'll go to the logo. So in this case, uh, I created a sketch on this plane here. So I wasn't able to choose this plane because this plane uh, was a, because I made it a curve, um, it's unable to select that plane to be, to be a sketch plane. You always, you need to have a flat plane to, to create your sketches. So for my logo, I decided to just do a simple uh, SSC for Student Startup Center. And I know I want it to be like diagonal. So I'm using this text tool. Right now I'm just getting the text out there. And now I can sort of start positioning where I want and sort of start defining the different, uh, different geometric relationships. So you see here, I'm using a construction line because I don't, the only thing I want to cut is the text. So I'm making this construction line, this guideline to sort of go through the middle using the coincident constraint. Coincident just means touching. So I'm creating a point at the midpoint of, of each of these uh, each of these text boxes. And now I want all the text to be the same size, so I'm using the equal constraint. Now I'm aligning each of these each of these text boxes to uh, along the line, and you can see that sometimes I need to actually. There's a little feature here, so 
if there's too many sort of overlapping uh, overlapping features, overlapping uh, entities, you can go and choose to select other, and you can actually go into a drop down menu and sort of choose what you want to select. So I want to select that origin. So now, now I can start sort of trying to drag everything around to get to the position that I want. And I can start sort of thinking about what, uh, what types of, what sort of relationship I want. So I want the corner of that to just touch the outside. So now that's constrained. And now I can adjust the size. So I want, I want the letters to all kind of overlap a little bit. But then I notice that the, uh, the text is actually a little bit too small. So I'm actually gonna have to go and edit that. So you see there's, you can make it bold. Like so. So right there you see uh, what's called over constraining. So this is when uh, this is when you put too much uh, too many constraints, too many sort of geometric restrictions where you have basically one one feature can be defined using two different uh, two different constraints. So that's like saying having for a box, having one side be defined twice um, by two by two numbers. So while they might be the same number um, when you define it, you might accidentally change one of them and then the software won't know which one to choose. So it'll sort of let you know when you've accidentally overdefined your uh, your uh, your sketch, and uh, you'll have to go back and sort of troubleshoot and fix that. So right now I'm deleting that sort of horizontal constraint, making sure that making sure they're not they're not constraints. So you'd see there was that. Let me go back there. So you see there's that uh, horizontal constraint where it was it inferred. That's probably where uh, the over constraint came from, is from one of those like inferred constraints. I'm gonna put it in a deliberately sort of unaligned position, is then I can I can add my own constraints to to align them uh, as I want. So now I'm just sort of playing around with it to get to a just a orientation that I like. And when I finish with it, um, since I don't actually have any like like numbers that um, that I know I want uh, I want this to be, and I just know that this looks pretty nice and I want it to stay like that. I'm using the fix constraint, so I'm fixing this line. Uh, to basically stay in place and uh, not move. Now I'm just changing the size of the letters to get to what I want. And that looks pretty good to me, so I'm just going to fix that, and you notice because of how I've uh, I've related everything, um, I was able to constrain just this one point, and that will that fully defines everything else. Um, and so I didn't know whether or not that was going to define everything, but uh, it just happened to do so. Um, if it if it didn't define everything, I would have to kind of go back and see where 
where things are unconstrained and then either fix that or define some other, uh, other constraints as well. Yeah, so highlighting that, uh, that fixed constraint. So now I want to do a remove, basically cutting into my part. So you notice I'm having to do a lot of work to select each of these, uh, select each of those outlines because of the overlapping, which is why um, I was mentioning the sort of importance of using a uh, construction geometry so that you don't have to accidentally, you don't have to go back and select one by one which, uh, which outlines you want. What I can do instead, since this entire sketch is in one sketch, I'm actually gonna go back and just select that entire sketch and then it does the work for me. The merge scope, the sort of what you want it to cut through. Yeah, so I can make it do a through all because that looks that does look pretty good. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it cut up to the space right here. And I don't want it to cut all the way through, so I'm using this offset distance. I'm just sort of playing around with the numbers to get to sort of just the depth that I like. And that looks pretty good to me. So, and that's basically my maker coin. Um, and what I do, what I do as well is, um, this is this is a feature that I actually like to use a lot, um, the move face tool. So, I actually want this uh, want these letters to be even even wider, um, but the bold only goes so bold. So. So with text, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit tedious because you have to select each and every one of these these faces. But you notice how it's just, it just pushes the uh, pushes the faces out in in a direction um, by a certain amount. I decided to choose zero point oh one. Um, so I'm going to go through and select each and. each of these faces. And, and just playing with it until I get to a good size that I like. That looks pretty good to me, so. Yeah, and that's it. Then you can sort of go to the different views. And so that's sort of the basics of how to design your own maker coin. Um, so before we go on to the next couple of videos where you kind of uh, show off just uh, a couple of different ways, uh, a couple more different ways to model something. Um, this time it's gonna be a Lego block. Um, does anyone have any questions? Awesome, thank you. All right, um, if there's no questions, uh, we'll go over to the next video. So, so this one is actually, um, so let, me, let me share my screen again. So this one is going to be modeling a Lego block. Um, let's see. Yeah, so this one's modeling a Lego block with, wait. Here we go. 
Uh, can everyone see the screen? All right, awesome. So this one is going to be modeling a Lego block with um, just a the just the process that uh, I explained before, which is iterative. So taking it from a single a single block and then adding features uh, one by one. So in this case, um, I'm going to be using millimeters instead of uh, instead of inches. So you can sort of choose the different length units that you want to use. Since I have this reference image here. So that's how I'm going to define um, our uh, the Lego block. So I'm defining it. So I'm defining all these using just uh, the reference sketch that I have, which just shows all the dimensions of everything. And you can also rename all of your sketches and features just, just to give a better idea of, uh, of what you're doing so, so people can sort of understand what each of those features do, what, what they are, stuff like that. So next, I'm going to define the walls. So that's using the offset tool. I'm using 1.6. So we'll sort of skip through these because you've seen this before. So in this case, I'm to cut it, I'm going up to face and I'm using this dimension here to create an offset. So I know I want it up to that face, but then only down uh, 1.6 millimeters. And next, so we have our walls. Next, we can start defining our, uh, our studs. So so in this case, I actually want to show the wall sketch that, that I had before, because I want to actually reference the studs to those walls, because I want it to be tangent. So just noting what the, uh, what the dimensions of that is. And from here, I can define some constraints. So now I'm going to do a linear pattern. And that just sort of uh, will repeat that circle in a regular pattern since I know, you know, Lego, Lego blocks the studs are, are pretty regular and I'm not defining the uh, the length of, of these because I'm actually going to delete it because I wanted to define it geometrically just so we don't have any uh, excessive uh, dimensions that we don't really need so I'm defining it using the tangent constraints again instead all right so we're naming Naming the sketch so we know what it does. And then selecting the sketch itself rather than having to select each of those outlines uh, one by one. And then noting the height. And 
And then lastly, we're going to, so what we're doing is we've selected a, the face here to start trading our, uh, the cylinder things, the tubes. So I'm just finding the two circles. So you notice there are dimensions there, but I'm actually not gonna use them. I'm going to define this all using constraints to what, uh, what we've already made. So since we know, um, since we already know a lot of the relationships between each of these components. So I know I want the, these circles to be tangent because we want it to fit together. And we also know that this, these two, uh, these two circles are actually the same size because if you suck, um, suck one of these in into this hole, it'll actually, it'll actually fit. So I'm just creating the equals constraint and there we go. So that's been fully defined without needing a single, uh, a single dimension. And we're doing the same, uh, the same pattern to just create three copies of it. And again, I don't want to define it numerically, I want to define it geometrically. And there we go. So now that's fully defined. So once I name it, I can now hide that sketch and then extrude it. So in this case, I chose the up to face option again and um, and I want it to align with the bottom of the block. So that way I don't have to actually define the, the depth of the extrude. And that's it. So I can rotate around to just sort of see what I did. Yeah, so that's uh, that's how you make the Lego block using just a pretty simple um, intuitive approach. The next one is a little bit less intuitive, but um, it could also be useful in another way. So in this case, I'm actually going to be using a, a single sketch to sort of define all of uh, all of my features of the Lego block. Now this. Uh, this is useful for if you have, like if you have a design that you know you're going to have to change a lot. And if the key, the key thing is that design intent. If, if it makes more sense to use a single sketch to define everything, um, then, then that'll be you know, at your own discretion. Um, so in this case, I'm using the offset tool to sort of uh, define these walls. So this way I'm able to sort of see the relationship of every, uh, of every little feature that, uh, that the Lego block has in all in a single sketch. So I'm doing the same thing. Um, I'm gonna define these, these diameters and define the tangents. And then going through the linear pattern again, the exact same, the exact same thing as I was doing before, only now this is just all in one sketch. And again, this is uh, the same thing. We're sort of defining the uh, the two features.
and then that that inner circle and then that same that same pattern process again I need to be tangent so now we have all of the all the features of of this Lego uh, this Lego block all in one sketch and I can I can sort of clearly see the relationships between everything Now this is when I can start making it. So since we want to sort of extrude everything from this sketch, I'm actually going to extrude this piece down um, because that just makes the most sense since I, we want these studs at the top. So I'm going to change that direction to make it go down. And again, referencing the dimensions. This way I can still I can still sort of name each of my features and to make sure that um, you know, that all still makes sense. So now I want to do the top. So you see there's there's a problem here where I want to select the entire face, but because it was all one sketch, I have to I have to select each uh, each piece uh, individually, and that's that's not ideal. So what I actually have to do is I have to create a new sketch, but I don't have to redefine every, anything because I can use the, uh, this tool, which is the use project tool. And that allows you to use basically geometry already existing in, the, in your model and just sort of projects it onto the plane that your sketch is on. So I just sort of, copies that onto your sketch. Again, going back to the drawing. And I want to make sure to add and not create a new sketch. Make sure it's in the right direction. And there we go. And the last, well, not quite last, but uh, we have to do the extrudes on the studs. So you notice this one is, um, I wasn't able to select the entire sketch because uh, it, if I did select the entire sketch, it would extrude everything um, not not just the uh, not just the studs so that's something that's not ideal but that's sort of the drawbacks of using sort of this method and last is the, the tubes and again I'm going to use the up to face and there we go. So now I see looking at this, uh, this sort of feature tree here. Um, Things are things look a lot cleaner, um, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Um, it's just another way of doing things, and it will depend on your model of uh, whether or not whether or not it's it's better to use this method or or the other method where you just add on to each feature. Um, so yeah, so now I hide it, and we get the exact same thing. And yeah, so that's the end of that's the end of the the video tutorials. Um, does anyone do you have any questions, comments?
Awesome. So, so with that, um, if nobody has any questions, um, that basically marks the end of this tutorial. Um, this so the recording of this this workshop will be posted online. Uh, I encourage everyone to uh, to go and try to make your own maker coin in CAD, in in Onshape, or if you're using another CAD program, and and yeah, so send us an email if you run into any trouble. Uh, we're we're here to help. Thanks for coming. What did you sign up for? Um, they should, they should be sent out pretty, uh, pretty immediately. Um, I'm not too sure. You should still be able to log in though without, uh, without the email confirmation, I think. I'm not too sure though. It's been, it's been a while since I've made a new account. Um, But yeah. Yeah, let us know. Uh, let us know if you're running any trouble. That went well.